In the name I am that I am, goddess of liberty, lords of karma, great cosmic council, four and twenty elders, we come before you at the court of King Arthur, each one carrying the ensign of his tribe and nation unto the Lord Sanat Kumara. We come to reason together in the heart of the Lord of the world and in the heart of our brother and savior, Jesus Christ. We come to seal ourselves and to be sealed in the diamond heart of Mary and El Moria. Let thy flame, O God, of victory be upon our brow, each one, for we are the victorious ones, and we claim it in the name Saint Germain. By the vision of the all-seeing eye of God and the capstone, we claim our presence in the I Am, the Great I Am, envisioned by all those who have gone before us on the path of consummate union with the living Christ. Seven archangels bold stand at our side in this hour as we proclaim liberty to the captives and healing unto all nations. O oh God, shake now our tree of life and let the leaves of our tree be for the healing of all those who began in thee, are thy issue, are the anointed, and have come to claim the earth as the God star of freedom. In the name of the living word and before thy altar, O God, we seal thy servants in thy vision in this hour, and we bow before thy just judgments, true and righteous. We give thanks to thee, Lord God Almighty, that thou hast taken to thee thy great power and hast reigned. In thy name, amen. Let us sing the battle hymn of the Republic. Number 687.
be seated. When the Son of Man shall come in his glory, and all the holy angels with him, then shall he sit upon the throne of his glory. And before him shall be gathered all nations, and he shall separate them one from another, as a shepherd divideth his sheep from the goats. And he shall set the sheep on his right hand, but the goats on the left. Then shall the king say unto them on his right hand, Come ye, blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was an hungered, and ye gave me meat. I was thirsty, and ye gave me drink. I was a stranger, and ye took me in. Naked, and ye clothed me. I was sick, and ye visited me. I was in prison, and ye came unto me. Then shall the righteous answer him, saying, Lord, when saw we thee, and hungered, and fed thee, or thirsty, and gave thee drink? When saw we thee a stranger, and took thee in, or naked, and clothed thee? Or when saw we sick, or in prison, and came unto thee? And the king shall answer, and say unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Inasmuch as ye have done it unto one of the least of these my brethren, ye have done it unto me. Then shall he say also unto them on the left hand, Depart from me, ye cursed, into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was an hungered, and ye gave me no meat. I was thirsty, and ye gave me no drink. I was a stranger, and ye took me not in. Naked, and ye clothed me not. Sick, and in prison, and ye visited me not. Then shall they also answer him, saying, Lord, when saw we thee an hungered, or a thirst, or a stranger, or naked, or sick, or in prison, and did not minister unto thee. Then shall he answer unto them, saying, Verily I say unto you, Inasmuch as ye did it not to one of the least of these, ye did it not to me. And these shall go away into everlasting punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. Glory, hallelujah. On November 29th, 1987, Saint Germain said in Washington, D.C., Keepers of the flame, by your leave I am sent from the great central sun to stand in the midst of this city as a pillar of violet flame, my aura then sealing a destiny, a destiny far spent. For America has abdicated her role as the nation of Christhood, the eternal law of God, as the nation wherein the Lord our righteousness should raise up a standard an ensign of the people, and a two-edged sword. Thus, beloved, through your hearts and yours alone, the light bearers in all the earth, those who know me and may not know my name but have espoused the cause of freedom and of peace, through them I shall continue to work.
My message to you from the heart of Saint Germain is entitled, The Abdication of America's Destiny. It is America's destiny to be the comforter nation, to fulfill the mandate given through the prophet Isaiah. Comfort ye, comfort ye, comfort ye, my people, saith your God. Our forefathers founded this nation on the principle of the comforter, the comforter of the unalienable rights to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness is the opportunity to walk the path of individual Christhood, to enjoy the fruits of one's sacred labor, to enjoy the abundant life. America is the place set apart from all nations where God's people were called to raise up an ensign a sign. That sign is the sign of the I Am Presence, individual Christhood, and the banner of Maitreya. This sign, this ensign, foretells the coming of the standard bearer. America, individual by individual and heart by heart, is sent by God to be the standard bearer of the path of individual Christhood, bringing that path to the nations of the world. All who would receive us, even as one of the least of these, the brethren of the Lord. America is the nation sponsored by the ascended masters of the great white brotherhood, who have come because Saint Germain has raised up his standard of freedom on these shores. Here then, as an experiment of freedom, we gather. We gather together through the master-disciple relationship under Jesus Christ and the apostles, Moses and the prophets, Gautama Buddha and the Bodhisattvas, all of whom trace their lineage to the Ancient of Days our Lord Sanat Kumara. America is destined to bring forth the culture of the Divine Mother that was once on Lemuria and Atlantis and previous Golden Age civilizations. The founding of the pyramid of her civilization is the path of the soul's reunion with the Divine Mother. The capstone of the pyramid is the highest spiritual teaching of East and West which Jesus taught to his disciples. That lost teaching regained and embodied heart by heart through the Lord our righteousness is the capstone that is yet to be placed on the pyramid. The teachings lost and now regained must become the living word ere we see the ceiling of the capstone of this civilization. The teaching of the chart of our divine self and the path of individual Christhood are the foundation and the height of America's destiny. Saint Germain teaches us that Americans are meant to champion every man's right to walk that path by bringing freedom and representative government to the nations of the world. Those representatives are called to be the anointed and the Christed ones who have raised up the light of the Ancient of Days in every race and nation, come to her shores, fulfill the destiny, and are prepared then to deliver that light and mandate to the point and home of their origin. Without the freedom we enjoy in America today, there is no individual path of testing, of initiation. Without individual liberty, People are not free to realize the Christ within, to balance their debts to life, their karma, and fulfill their divine plan. The early Americans compared the colonies to the tribes of Israel, their trials, their tribulations, and their God-ordained destiny, and referred to America as the new Israel. 
Many preachers in the 18th and 19th centuries developed this theme. They gave their sermons titles like the Republic of the Israelites, an example to the American states, and traits of resemblance in the people of the United States of America to ancient Israel. Thomas Jefferson said in his second inaugural address delivered in 1805, I shall need the favor of that being in whose hands we are, who led our fathers as Israel of old from their native land and planted them in a country flowing with all the necessaries and comforts of life. Archaeologist Raymond Capt writes, Our pilgrim fathers call themselves the seed of Abraham, God's servants, children of Jacob, his chosen. They followed after the counsel of Moses, the lawgiver of Israel in all their undertakings, asked for guidance and the blessings of the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. God's covenant with Abraham founded the nation of Israel. The Lord commanded our father, the patriarch, get thee out of thy country and from thy kindred and from thy father's house unto a land that I will show thee and I will make of thee a great nation, and I will bless thee and make thy name great, and thou shalt be a blessing, and I will bless them that bless thee, and curse him that curseth thee, and in thee shall all families of the earth be blessed. Our forefathers believed that through the founding of the United States of America, all families of the earth would be blessed. They believed that the American Revolution was fought not just for themselves or for the 13 colonies, but for the whole world. They saw their experiment as a gift to all mankind. Historian Bernard Balin says that what was essentially involved in the American Revolution was the realization, the comprehension and fulfillment of the inheritance of liberty and of what was taken to be America's destiny in the context of world history. The Founding Fathers believed, says Balin, that the colonization of British America had been an event designed by the hand of God to satisfy his ultimate aims. John Adams said, I always consider the settlement of America with reverence and wonder as the opening of a grand scene and design in Providence for the illumination of the ignorant and the emancipation of the slavish part of mankind all over the earth. By 1776, writes Balin, Americans had come to think of themselves as in a special category, uniquely placed by history to capitalize on, to complete and fulfill the promise of man's existence. The liberties of mankind and the glory of human nature is in their keeping, John Adams wrote in the year of the Stamp Act. America was designed by providence for the theater of which man was to make his true figure, on which science, virtue, liberty, happiness, and glory were to exist in peace. James Madison wrote, happily for Americans, happily we trust for the whole human race. The founders pursued a new and more noble course. New England clergyman Lyman Beecher said in a speech given in 1832 that America was destined to lead the way of moral and political emancipation of the world. It is time she understood her high calling and were harnessed for the work the work that is the Lord's work. The moving force behind the revolution and the formation of the United States was Freemasonry. As many as 53 of the 56 signers of the Declaration of Independence were Masons, and all but five of the 55 members of the Constitutional Convention were Masons. They were not only concerned about the physical establishment of the new nation, but also the fulfillment of its inner calling. W.L. Wilmhurst, author of The Meaning of Masonry, 
writes that the purpose of masonry is the expediting of the spiritual evolution of those who aspire to perfect their own nature and transform it into a more godlike quality. The mason's goal is to become a just man made perfect with larger consciousness and faculties, an efficient instrument for use by the great architect in his plan of rebuilding the temple of fallen humanity and capable of initiating and advancing other men to our participation in the same great work. The word Israel means in Hebrew, he will rule as God. This was the goal of our founding fathers for America, the new Israel, to embody that Lord our righteousness, to be the instrument of the one who rules as God. The ascended masters have taught us about America's destiny and mission in the world. St. Germain said in April of 1968, America is in effect today the key to the destiny of the world. The ascended masters do not actually work for only one nation. They work for the entire human family. My great love for America is because I have felt through the ages since the formation of this land that America had the potential to become a way shower to the world, a cup of light that would enable the emergent democracies in the world to be able to uphold the teachings and principles of good example, which mankind would show forth here in this world. Again in June 1977, St. Germain said, people of light, accept your mission of the ages, accept your role as the ones who are the protectors of freedom on earth. This indeed is America's destiny to teach a way of life that is a form of government whereby each threefold flame and every living soul may commune with God and out of that communion evolve one vote and cast that vote for freedom. America is meant to teach other nations. On New Year's Eve 1985, Gautama Buddha explained, the people of this nation have an endowment and a protection from the Master Saint Germain. The key is that America must come to her original purpose and fulfill it. She has ever been established and sponsored by Saint Germain as the Guru Nation, whose people should be going forth to transfer his science, his economy, his religion, his way of life, which represents that of the entire Great White Brotherhood to every nation. The mantle has not yet been taken from them to restore the earth to the place of peace and freedom. Let us sing then to old glory the sign of the standard and the standard bearer and the symbol of our raising up of the Christ and the I am presence, the star spangled banner. Number 680.
America, we love you. America, we love you. America, we love you. And our love is great enough to hold you eternally victorious in the light. Thank you. Please be seated. The abdication of America's destiny. The turning point in America's history was the assassination of Abraham Lincoln at 10.13 p.m. April 14, 1865. President Lincoln was the archetype of America's emergent Christhood through a path of individualism. In the footsteps of the Master of Galilee, Abraham Lincoln was born in humble surroundings, a log cabin in the backwoods of Kentucky. Lincoln fought to preserve the Union. His secondary goal was to free the Negro slaves although he said he would not free them at the expense of the Union. He was opposed by business and financial interests in both the North and South. With his assassination, the balance of power shifted from we the people to a power elite that is controlled the higher levels of government, the economy and cultural life ever since. As a result, the union for which Lincoln gave his life has been steadily subverted in an ongoing revolution that has in practice nearly destroyed the delicate architecture of the American Republic with its limited powers, checks and balances and individual sovereignty. Concurrently, the people of America have become progressively disenfranchised. The history of the Civil War 1861 to 65 is complex. Lincoln was opposed by a variety of groups. In the North, these included speculators, financiers, and the anti-Lincoln, anti-South radical Republican senators. In the South, the Confederate leaders, businessmen, and bankers opposed Lincoln. Lincoln's military blockade of the South was an obstacle to their desire to trade with one another. Between the years 1861 and 1865, trade between the North and the South produced a strange series of alliances. In their book, The Lincoln Conspiracy, David Balziger and Charles E. Sellier, Jr., working from the missing pages of John Wilkes Booth's diary, as well as standard Civil War histories, trace the efforts of Booth to help the South. Booth talked with financier Judah Benjamin, a Confederate cabinet minister, and took him to meet the president of the Confederacy, Jefferson Davis. Davis arranged funds for Booth to conduct trade for the Confederacy, and Benjamin arranged for Booth to meet with important Northern speculators. Booth later met with Jay Cook, a Philadelphia financier, and his brother Henry Cook, a Washington banker. Balziger and Sellier point out that for Booth, this was a curious situation. One of the top men in the Confederacy's cabinet had sent him to meet the very bankers who financed Lincoln's war. Booth was dedicated to the victory of the Confederacy and could not understand why important figures from opposing camps would be cooperating. In addition to the Cook brothers, Booth met gold and cotton speculators Bankers and industrialists, including political boss Thurlow Weed, Samuel Noble, a New York cotton broker, and radical Republican Senator Zachariah Chandler. Balziger and Sellier point out that at the meeting, Jay Cook declared, I will continue to have dealings with the Confederacy, not out of fear of betrayal, but because in peace and in war, a businessman must do business, whatever the stakes. At the end of the meeting, Cook told Booth, there are millions of dollars in profits to be made, and we are being denied our share. We'll be ruined if Lincoln's policies are continued. Out of this strange alliance emerged a successful plot to assassinate President Abraham Lincoln. 
Balsiger and Sellier show that the plot to assassinate Lincoln included not only the frustrated racist John Wilkes Booth, but also Edwin Stanton, Lincoln's Secretary of War, who coveted the presidency, as well as greedy financiers who wanted Lincoln out of their way because he was interfering with their trade. On the night of April 14, 1865, John Wilkes Booth shot the president as he sat with Mrs. Lincoln in the balcony of Ford's Theater. The country has never been the same. A new elite emerged thereafter. The Civil War destroyed the power of the Southern landholding aristocracy and established the Northern industrial powers. A new plutocracy emerged from the war and reconstruction. Masters of money who were no less self-conscious and no less powerful than the planter aristocracy of the Old South, wrote historians Samuel Morrison Eliot and Henry Commager. The war which had gone far to flatten out class distinctions in the South tended to accentuate class differences in the North. This set the stage for their emergence as a national ruling class. Lincoln's assassination triggered an era of political chaos, which was to be instrumental in the rise of the power elite in America. Following the Civil War, the robber barons, men such as Jay Gould, John D. Rockefeller, Cornelius Vanderbilt, and John Jacob Astor, and those of like mind, seized power of the institutions of the country through their unscrupulously gained wealth. Like all other nations, America has always been led by elites. Prior to and during the Revolutionary War, 1776 to 1783, the elite had been composed largely of civic-minded individuals who participated in one of the most complete inquiries into the political requirements for liberty. This took place in a lively debate that began sometime around 1750 and led to the framing of the Constitution in 1787. According to social critic C. Wright Mills, America's elite developed in stages. From the years spanning the revolution through the beginning of the 19th century, America's elite were political men of education and of administrative experience, and as Lord Bryce noted, possessed of certain largeness of view and dignity of character. Mills says that during the next period of time, roughly from Jefferson to Lincoln, 1801 to 1865, no set of men controlled centralized means of power. No small clique dominated economic, much less p political affairs. For this was the period when the elite was at most a loose coalition. Nevertheless, a power elite, an American ruling class which would seize control of the nation's institutions, was rapidly developing. In 1933, President Franklin Roosevelt, a bona fide member of the American ruling class, wrote to Colonel Edward House, a Kissinger-like figure, the real truth of the matter is, as you and I know, that a financial element in the larger centers has owned the government ever since the days of Andrew Jackson, that is, since the 1830s. After the assassination of Lincoln, everything changed. It was at that point, according to Mills, that the supremacy of corporate economic power began in a formal way with the congressional elections of 1866. Prior to the Civil War, there were few large fortunes. After the Civil War, an American ruling class, a power elite, quickly gained control of the institutions of the nation and used them to gain great wealth and power. It is hard to imagine just how unscrupulous this new elite was. C. Wright Mills, summarizing the words of several critics of the robber barons, says, the robber barons, as the tycoons of the post-Civil War era came to be called, descended upon the investing public much as a swarm of women might descend into a bargain basement on Saturday morning. They exploited national resources, waged economic wars among themselves, entered into combinations, made private capital out of the public domain, and used any and every method to achieve their ends. 
They made agreements with railroads for rebates. They purchased newspapers and bought editors. They killed off competing and independent businesses and employed lawyers of skill and statements of repute to sustain their rights and secure their privileges. There is something demonic about these lords of creation. It is not merely rhetoric to call them robber barons. Perhaps there is no straightforward economic way to accumulate $100 million for private use. Although, of course, along the way, the unstraightforward ways can be delegated and the appropriator's hands kept clean. If all the big money is not easy money, all the easy money that is safe is big. It is better so the image runs to take one dime from each of 10 million people at the point of a corporation than $100,000 from each of 10 banks at the point of a gun. It is also safer. End of Mill's quote. The financial moguls of the late 19th and early 20th centuries made a conscious effort to seize the power of the nation's institutions as a means of enriching themselves. They recognized that they could not gain great wealth any other way. They also realized that they were carrying out a revolution of sorts since they had to neutralize or circumvent the constitutional and legal barriers to their activities. There emerged a set of unspoken rules by which they operated, which were oddly enough written down in 1906 by power elite financier George Howe in his book entitled Confessions of a Monopolist. Says Howe, these are the rules of big business. They have superseded the teachings of our parents and are reducible to a single maxim. Get a monopoly, let society work for you. And remember that the best of all business is politics. For a legislative grant, franchise, subsidy, or tax exemption is worth more than a Kimberley or a Comstock load. These were fabulously rich diamond and gold loads, respectively. Says how, since it does not require any labor, either mental or physical, for its exploitation. Commenting on this, Professor Anthony Sutton points out, Old John D. Rockefeller and his 19th century fellow capitalists were convinced of one absolute truth, that no great monetary wealth could be accumulated under the impartial rules of a competitive, laissez-faire society, that the only sure road to the acquisition of massive wealth was monopoly. Drive out your competitors, reduce competition, eliminate laissez-faire, and above all, get state protection for your industry through compliant politicians and government regulation. This last avenue yields a legal monopoly, and a legal monopoly always leads to wealth. Howe wrote, Mr. Rockefeller may think he made his hundreds of millions by economy, by saving on his gas bills, but he didn't. He managed to get the people of the globe to work for him. Sutton says this robber baron schema is also under different labels, the socialist plan. The difference between a corporate state monopoly and a socialist state monopoly is essentially only the identity of the group controlling the power structure. The essence of socialism is monopoly control by the state, using hired planners and academic sponges. On the other hand, Rockefeller, Morgan, and their corporate friends aim to acquire and control their monopoly and to maximize its profits through influence in the state political apparatus. This, while it still needs hired planners and academic sponges, is a discreet and far more subtle process than outright state ownership under socialism. Tony Sutton continues, Success for the Rockefeller gambit has depended particularly upon focusing public attention upon largely irrelevant and superficial historical creations, such as the myth of a struggle between capitalists and communists and careful cultivation of political forces by big business. We call this phenomenon of corporate legal monopoly market control acquired by using political influence by the name of corporate socialism. Howe recognized that there was a profound difference between free market capitalism and the capitalism he and his fellow capitalists practiced. 
In his Confessions of a Monopolist, he wrote, This is the story of something for nothing, of making the other fellow pay. This making the other fellow pay of getting something for nothing explains the lust for franchises, mining rights, tariff privileges, railway control, tax evasions. All these things mean monopoly, and all monopoly is bottomed on legislation. Monopoly and corruption are cause and effect. Together they work in Congress, in our commonwealths, in our municipalities. It is always so. It always has been so. Privilege gives birth to corruption. Just as the poisonous sewer breeds disease, equal chance, a fair field and no favors, the square deal are never corrupt. Howe says they do not appear in legislative halls nor in council chambers. For these things mean labor for labor, value for value, something for something. This is why the little businessman, the retail and wholesaler dealer, the jobber and the manufacturer are not the businessmen whose business corrupts politics. What we are seeing here is a nation founded upon a dispensation of tremendous light and energy from the great causal body of Saint Germain. We see the original founding fathers chosen and picked by the master, sponsored as his initiates and chilas. We see that light becoming America. We see the movement of people from the 13 colonies across the land. We see everything coming to life by the power and presence of Saint Germain. Then we see those who have not that original light, have no heart tied to the master, are not sponsored by him. They have no direct access to the light of the I am that I am. Say, they see the people of light coming from all shores throughout the world. They see them arriving here to fulfill the grand experiment in freedom. They see them becoming a part of the great tapestry of America, stitch by stitch, life by life, hard one. They move in to control, to subjugate, to once again elevate themselves as royalty, as privilege. They believe they are royalty. They believe they are privilege. Because they have descended from heaven, they are the fallen angels. They have come to subjugate and betray the Christ of all people. They know that light produces the wealth and the health of the economy. They are come to live off of it and to make all Americans their slaves. According to Professor Sutton, in modern America, the most significant illustration of society as a whole, working for the few, is the 1913 Federal Reserve Act. The Federal Reserve System is in effect a private banking monopoly, not answerable to Congress or to the public, but with legal monopoly control over money supply without let or hindrance or even audit by the General Accounting Office. It was irresponsible manipulation of money supply by this Federal Reserve System that brought about the inflation of the 1920s, the 1929 Depression, and so the presumed requirement for a Roosevelt New Deal. Sutton points out that the groundwork for the Federal Reserve System was laid at an unpublicized meeting at the J.P. Morgan Country Club on Jekyll Island, Georgia in November 1910. Sutton says, Senator Nelson Aldridge, bankers Frank Vanderlip, president of National City Bank and representing Rockefeller and Kuhn Loeb interests, Henry B. Davison, senior partner of J.P. Morgan, Charles Norton, president of Morgan's First National Bank, met in secret to decide how to foist a central bank system on the United States. Others at the meeting were Paul Moritz Warburg, the German banker, and Benjamin Strong, a Morgan banker who later became first governor of the Federal Reserve Bank of New York. Out of the Jekyll Island cobble came the basic bill passed by Congress and signed into law by President Woodrow Wilson as the Federal Reserve Act of 1913. This Jekyll Island cabal came, the basic bill, 
and it was passed by Congress. Thus, we have inherited from these masterminds meeting in secret behind closed door the central banking system. Under the earlier sub-treasury system, bankers had no control over the money supply in the United States, and even less to their liking, none over currency issues. In his autobiography, From Farm Boy to Financier, Jekyll Island participant Frank Vanderlip was quite open about the origins of the Federal Reserve System. He says, our secret expedition to Jekyll Island was the occasion of the actual conception of what eventually became the Federal Reserve System. The essential points of the Aldridge Plan were all contained in the Federal Reserve Act as it was passed. The power elite came to dominate both the Republican and Democratic parties. They elected and defeated presidents, especially in the post-Civil War days, and simply bought senators and judges. They gained control of the media and set the national agenda and the tone of the, of the debate, and set the tone of the debate on the issues. But ultimately, it was the American people who were at fault. They allowed these men to control them instead of electing those who would follow the principles of the Founding Fathers. Lincoln once said, if destruction be our lot, we must ourselves be its author and finisher. As a nation of free men, we must live through all time or die by suicide. America, we have got to get in there and kick out the power brokers. It's the moneyed interests who have been responsible for the wars of this century. It's the capitalists who have built up Nazi Germany and the communists and betray the people of light around the world. Unless we stop them in the name of Almighty God, we too will have abdicated even our right to decide the life or death of our nation. If we allow them to kill our nation, it may be suicide by proxy, but it will still be suicide. If this nation is destroyed by others because we do nothing, it will be just the same as if we had destroyed it ourselves. If we want to fulfill our destiny, it's time we realize who the real culprits are and stop allowing them to use our nation as a piece in their chess game for the taking of the world. Civilizations do fall for lack of leadership and the real cause of their collapse is always self-destruction. Historian Arnold Toynbee conducted an exhaustive study of the world's civilizations. He recognized that a civilization cannot continue to grow unless it can successfully respond to all challenges. This parallels the life of the individual. When you cease to be able to meet all challenges to your identity, to your life, to your personhood, to your path, and to your soul, you will cease to grow and wither away. He also concluded that as a civilization evolves, more of its challenges are internal rather than external. He said it has to reckon less and less with challenges delivered by external forces and demanding responses on an outer battlefield, and more and more with challenges that are presented by itself to itself in an inner arena. What we see here is that nations go through the identical phases of initiation as the individual. We deal with the objective enemy without, and then we turn to deal with the subjective enemy within. The criterion of growth is progress towards self-determination without the hindrance of either. Growth is dependent upon creativity, ingenuity, the ability to put down those forces that assail one's highest calling. Perpetual flexibility and spontaneity is what we need when we are fighting for our highest reality. The ability of a nation to defend itself against external and internal challenges depends on comparable spiritual development. Real progress, wrote Toynbee, is found to consist in a process defined as etherealization, 
and overcoming of material obstacles, which releases the energies of the society to make responses to challenges which henceforth are internal rather than external, spiritual rather than material. If a society cannot etherealize or spiritually transcend itself, then the civilization breaks down and enters what he calls a time of troubles preceding its ultimate dissolution. Nations as people come to the hour of self-transcendence, when all of the foundation of the pyramid that they have built comes to that moment of quintessence, of focusing in the capstone and transcendence to give birth then to a golden age. If the components are not ready for it, the civilization cannot remain static or at one place. To cease to grow then means to cease to be. Whether the individual abdicate his path of individual Christhood or a nation abdicate hers. One of Toynbee's most important conclusions is that civilizations die by suicide and not by invasion. The most that an alien enemy has achieved, he says, has been to give an expiring suicide his coup de grace, the final blow that brings death to a sufferer. When individual by individual a nation abdicates a path in the master-disciple relationship under Jesus Christ, then the nation as a whole must flounder and fall. In the light of this understanding of histories of all civilizations, we can see why Jesus has cried unto us and called us to be his disciples, even naming the date of November 1st, 1987, when that hour must be that we begin in earnest to realize that path of individual Christhood. You can see why he has called for 10,000 keepers of the flame, because there must be light bearers in a nation who fulfill this chemistry, this alchemy, at this hour when a nation must transcend itself or die by suicide. It is the choice at the why that America has come to, to choose to embrace the living Christ for the purposes of giving to others and not for selfish purposes as the power elite would take that Christ or to choose not to be and to take one, what light one has taken for the glorification of the self, thus entering the left-handed path of those that Jesus in his last judgment placed to his left. The goats are to the left, the sheep are to the right. One taking the right-handed path of the glory of God, one taking the left of the glory of the ego. When the power elite rose up, it was for the glorification of their identity as fallen ones through the light that is the money of the people. Therefore, the shift in the divine purpose of the nation. We had been taken over by fallen ones and their agenda of their false hierarchy of America. The fulcrum for change, change for the better or for the worse, is a civilization's leadership. Toynbee sees two types of leadership classes, the creative minority and the dominant minority. Here we see the creative minority as the sons and daughters of God co-creators with him. The dominant minority, those who subjugate the people by the abuse of power. Toynbee explains that the creative minority have the ability to lead civilization up the mountain of self-transcendence, the founding fathers, the masons, the light bearers, those who knew they were the descendants of Israel. And a society's transfiguration comes only as its people imitate this creative minority. Thus, Selmoria wants the profile of your Christhood and of leadership in you to shine. He wants your example to be an image of what the people deserve raised up in the highest office in the land. 
when the creative minority lose their creativity and become oppressive, when they let the threefold flame go out and the divine spark, they degenerate into a dominant minority which rules by force. Thus the light bearers are displaced by the fallen ones who come in their cunning with their serpent schemes and their plots of takeover. And they are well organized plots. Therefore the light bearers off guard, not fully integrated on the path of initiation for want of a true path of religion, a true path of God government understood and taught to them. They are set aside and displaced for those in whom no light burns. In reaction to this, the people withdraw their allegiance to their leaders and no longer seek to imitate them. Toynbee says this schism between the people and their leaders marks the disintegration of the civilization and heralds an epoch in which it is no longer able to adequately respond to challenges. Today, Western civilization is the preeminent world civilization, and America is its leader. Since Lincoln was assassinated, a dominant minority concerned solely with the interests of the ruling class has gradually replaced the creative minority in America. Today, that transition is virtually complete. Let's face it. And we have seen the people allow their leaders continually to make decisions that were not in the best interests of their nation or the world. As a result in this change in leadership, the United States has taken a series of steps by which she has abdicated her destiny. Although we have had bad presidents in this century, we can see the profile of the disillusionment with President Reagan, both in the Democratic and the Republican parties. We can see that he appears today as a man not of his word, a man in whom the people have no confidence. The United States abdicated her responsibility to provide the abundant life when she went off the gold standard. This happened in stages. President Roosevelt took the first step in April of 1933 when he declared a national emergency and deprived American citizens of the right to own gold and use it as a medium of exchange. This is the most hellish and damnable act perpetrated against the people of this nation. President Nixon took the final step in 1971 when he suspended the convertibility of the dollar for gold internationally. We were then fully on the paper standard. This is a violation of the spirit and the letter of Article 1, Section 10 of the Constitution, which says, no state shall make anything but gold or silver coin tender in payment of debt. The combined weight of statements by a member of the framers, a text analysis of the Constitution, Supreme Court decisions, and the actions of the First Congress which in 1792 created a monetary system based on gold and silver, makes it clear that the framers intended Congress to use gold and silver coin as money. At the time the Constitution was being framed, the nation was in the midst of a terrible inflation caused by the expansion of the continental, a paper currency. During the debate over the wording of Article 1, Section 10, Roger Sherman, a delegate to the Constitutional Convention said, this is a favorable crisis for crushing paper money. Thomas Jefferson and John Adams both wrote about the evils of paper money. Bankers plotted to control the currency beginning in November 1910. Representatives of Morgan and Rockefeller met secretly with Senator Nelson Aldridge to plan a central bank. The plan came to fruition in 1913 when Congress created the Federal Reserve System. It gave control of the nation's money to the banking community in violation of Article I, Section 8 of the Constitution, which gives to Congress the power to coin money 
and regulate the value thereof. Now the Fed, serving the interests of the banking community, exercises the unilateral right to expand and contract the supply of money and credit and create periods of boom and bust. The ramifications of this state of affairs are almost beyond calculation. Today, we could have a bust worse than the Great Depression of the 1930s. The power elite used the depression to concentrate power in the central government. Doubtless, they will do the same in a future bust. If we have another depression, it will be America's karma, because we the people have turned over our power and our abundant life to the godless, to the bankers in the form of the Federal Reserve System and its 12 member banks. In turning over the power of our monetary system to the fallen ones, we have sealed the decline and ruination of our economy. This is what is behind the national debt, foreign loans, non-payment, the debt bomb abroad and in the United States, the falling value of the dollar. This is so major that to turn it around will take once again a president of the stature of Abraham Lincoln and greater.